I've loved seeing the kids have a childhood. I didn't have that, and so to be able to give that to someone else has yeah, been really special. I had a rough childhood with my parents, my mom being very depressed, my dad being very angry, them not getting along. I was an only child. I was the good girl that was pleasing everybody and growing up at the public eye and then going through a very public affair. I mean, there was just a lot. I feel like my shows and anything that I do is kind of like a place to help people feel and go to those places they don't normally go. And music is just one outlet to be able to do that. When you were younger, you would walk onto stage completely fearless. Stage fright was a new thing that you were having to deal with down the line. Yeah. Would it tip into panic ever? Um, Leanne, thank you for being on Happy Place, the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to, I'm going to say meet you because I don't think I have met you before. I don't think we've met, now. Which is absurd because we both started out in the 90s yes. in similar worlds and we haven't crossed paths. This is such a lovely moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited to talk to you today. You're in the UK, mm -hmm. but you're coming back to the UK yes. next year for your biggest UK show yeah, to date at the O2. I know. We're playing the O2. I'm so excited. It's such an iconic venue and... I was there um, when they the first year for C2C and um, played there and like 17,000 people felt like my living room. So we're hoping to recreate that intimacy. Um, I feel like my shows are super intimate and no matter how big the place is, I, I just love kind of making people feel warm and f fuzzy and like they're, you know, like in my living room, basically. Why do you think you're able to do that? Do you think it's the lyrics? Because, uh, you know, a lot of your lyrics are incredibly personal. Yeah. Maybe, I guess everyone's got their own story mm -hmm. to each song. Do you think that helps kind of bring everything oh, yeah. into a more intimate setting? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in the past decade for me, especially writing a lot of my own material, I feel like people have really gotten to know me, you know, and I... um. Yeah, I feel like everything is so personal. And I feel like I've also, I, I feel like my shows and anything that I do is kind of like a place to help people feel and go to those places they don't normally go. And um, I, I think that's what I, when I think of myself, I think of myself as someone that is a facilitator of that and not really a singer, that music is just one outlet to be able to do that. So um, yeah, I think it's just, I'm super open and I'm, I've always been that way on stage and even more so in the past decade. And I think it's just how I walk out and who I am on stage allows people to, to kind of meet me in that place. So It's so lovely, isn't it? Because, I mean, obviously many people who have listened to your music or perhaps seen you sing live... You you make you can make people cry like that's. I, mean, it's I a love doing skill. that, by the way. It's a great skill. <laughs> I make myself cry along the way. I'm sure you do. But I, do. I think many of us are quite repressed in that way, and yeah. we don't allow ourselves to just wail and weep. But yeah. you know, your music can take it people. It brings there. it out of people yeah. for sure, which I love, um, and that it brings it out of me too. I mean, it's so healing to be able to to do what I do, and especially these last several records of mine, and you know, as I've written my own material, like just to be able to communicate what's going on in my world. And because I know I'm not the only one experiencing these feelings and um, to meet people there is, it's so much more than just music. Um, it's a, it's a real like emotional, physical like experience. It's so good to have a cry. Yeah, it is. It's really <laughs> I good. I do it all the time. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> done it recently and I, I feel like there's some there, there's some tears there. Uh, they need to cut them up. Yeah. Should I start singing now? No, <laughs> maybe not right now. Maybe at the end we can have like a group <laughs> cry good. together. But uh, I think, yeah, we, you know, we forget we're holding so much and we're walking around holding in, you know, things from the past and feelings or something someone said to us that day and we don't just give ourselves a time to just have a really jolly good cry it's oh so gosh, good for the yes. soul absolutely it's amazing what the body holds like yeah. even today i've been running around doing a ton of interviews and i had a like an hour break and i'm like oh my god my head hurts my body aches like you just don't realize even though i'm having fun it's like how much stress is in yeah. the body and then you lay down for a second and you're like oh Oh my yeah, God. and you take a deep breath. Like I'm not breathing right now. <laughs> you forget the breathing. <laughs> this is what I do. I yeah. hold my breath. But I think, especially when you speak publicly and you're doing oh interviews, God. yes, you yeah. do have to build a bit of a fortress around yourself yeah. to walk into that space totally. because. You know, you might get asked something personal or you move into an area where you might be feeling like, well, I'm actually exploring those thoughts and feelings as I speak out yeah. loud. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah, I think it's it's a tricky thing to do and you yeah. sort of forget how much you are maybe holding your breath or tensing your muscles and that mm. we're all doing this all day long, whether mm. we're nervous to socialise or we're 
you know, going through something challenging that we are physically holding on to all this stuff. Yeah, it's really been interesting for me because I grew up, you know, in front of the public eye. And so I I had to realize how much I actually like armor myself when I'm out in the world because I there's constantly something or someone coming at me. And it, over these past few years, I've realized like how much stress I hold in my body just like moving in the world. Um, cause I built, like you said, this kind of fortress around yeah. myself and I had to, I constantly am reminding myself like life is like, it's life can be easy and I can be at ease because I, I, I from, as, from the time I was a child, I was, you know, built up these kind of walls. So, um, yeah, life is my friend. Yeah. Life is my friend. Like, <laughs> you got to remind let yourself of this stuff. Yeah, yeah I do. Because I think especially when, whether when you're in the public eye. Yeah, or I mean, you, everyone does it. Yeah, or even if you've had some bad news in the past, mm-hmm. maybe the, the phone ringing triggers that sort of Absolutely, response. Absolutely, yeah. you know, I've certainly had that where you receive bad news on the phone or there's something, a bit of bad news that lands in your lap. And if it's big enough to rock your world at mm-hmm. that time, you actually do then start to walk around waiting for the next yeah. thing. And it's not a nice feeling. And I think you do have to possibly on a daily um, basis remind yourself everything's okay. Yeah. It's like you say, life's my friend. It's yeah. all okay. And it ebbs and flows. Like, yeah. you know, nothing's ever going to be bad forever and no. nothing's ever going to be great forever. So it's like, you know, you, you, you're right. You can't sit around waiting for the for the other, you know, shoe to drop. And that's... I've spent a lot of my life doing that yeah. and I, I could totally relate to that. And now I'm now I know how resilient I am and I I know that I can pretty much handle anything and it doesn't feel good sometimes, but I know that I will come back from it. You don't seem you know, obviously you've been through situations that have taken you to the place where you do feel on edge about what someone's gonna say or what news is gonna come out about you. But talking to you now and watching various interviews you of you um, interviews of you over the years you don't seem to have built up a sort of a tough shell like no. an exterior you're not guarded you no. seem still you've got the ability to be very open and to talk very naturally mm. about things how do you think you've navigated that you know what um i think learning how to say no mm. and even if and someone asks me a question i don't want to answer um you know saying i'm not comfortable with that like it, n- learning that it's okay to actually disappoint someone or just to say no to someone in this business as, especially as a child you know we were, I wasn't taught to say no I was like everything was yes and you do everything everyone asks because you want people to like you and now I'm like I can I can still be kind and say I'm not comfortable with that you know so um and sometimes sometimes it's hard like sometimes I have to like override <laughs> that switch because you know mm. you just get in this pattern of going yes I'll just please you and do everything you want me to do and um, I think when I started just giving myself permission to just politely say no, um, then I could be more open and, you know, more, a little less guarded for sure. And do you still worry about, oh my God, if I say no, will they dislike me? Do you worry about that? Not really That's anymore. Great. No, it's. I do. Yeah, you do? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, no, I gotta work I mean, on it's, it. it's sometimes, I, sometimes I'll walk away from situations knowing I've disappointed someone and kind of feel like, ugh. A guilt of disappoint disappointing someone else but um no I I can't I don't know I can't think about that because ultimately at the end of the day if I'm doing things that I don't really want to do I'm going to dislike myself mm-hmm. and living with that is a lot more challenging than living with disappointing someone else yeah so. and it's a hard lesson to learn because you've got yeah. to actually put it into practice you and do experience it and <laughs> you white do. knuckle it and and then and as much as I've put it into practice like I said sometimes I I don't practice it and sometimes I give in to whatever that thing is someone wants me to do and it's like oh okay going let, let's let's repattern that let's go back to to saying no when I when I mean no yeah. and I guess it also depends on how you're feeling that day you it's know true. some days you are we all naturally just feel a bit more resilient or comfortable. And more adult. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Sometimes we're like in our adult woman 41 yes. self. And then sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, can revert back to being 15 at times. So, you, you know, you talk about those triggers in life and you never know what it is that triggers triggers you. But sometimes you're just unconscious of it and kind of revert back to your shell a little bit. You yeah. Know? I'm so fascinated in that one. I was talking to a friend just literally at the weekend about... Some days that you do, you know, you go and go to a social event and you feel like, yeah, I'm, well, I'm 42, I'm 42, I'm 42, I'm walking around. <laughs> Some days you yeah. literally, I go back to being maybe 22, like mm-hmm. a 20 year regression. And yeah. I'm like, why have I shown up at 
at the age of 22 today and I, I sort of seemingly can't function outside of that age bracket mm. for it could be an hour or it could be a whole day. It might depend on who I'm interacting with or if I feel safe in the situation mm. or whatever. But it's a really strange thing. I don't think it gets talked about enough that most of us are walking around feeling like this, but we assume everyone else is their, right. uh, you know, their age. <laughs> their best self. Yeah, and their like, best self yeah. at the sort of mature uh, right. age they're at, but it's yeah. not the case. No, and sometimes, I mean, for me, I know... Like if I'm feeling really like gross in my body or I feel like I'm feel bloated or I don't feel pretty that day or I feel like, you know, you can just start to feel, um, you can just start to make yourself feel smaller um, just because of some insecurities that might be popping up. And other times I'm like, yeah, I'm like the queen today. Yes. <laughs> no, so it's, it really does depend on the day. Yeah. For, um, but yeah, I mean, we can all revert back to to being those little wounded children and it happens with everyone. There's not a single person that that doesn't happen to. I agree. I mean, you obviously had an exceptionally um, extraordinary childhood, starting in the industry so, so young. I mean, mm. a young teenager. Yeah. And it is a lot to take on. Not only just the brevity and just the, the speed, the pace that you're working at mm. is extraordinary at that age. Also, you're surrounded exclusively by adults. You don't mm. have that one-on-one -on -one kid interaction that you would in a normal childhood. Yeah. The pressure, the the exterior commentary that's pretty relentless yeah. when that's, you're globally famous. That's probably the, the the hardest part is like so many there's so many voices, yeah, so many opinions, and you don't even know who you are yet. Um, it took me I don't know till my 30s to really figure out who am I like without anybody else's opinion. And I think these last like maybe four or five years, I really started to live from the inside out instead of outside in. So it's like, okay, well, what makes me happy and what lights me up? And even down to, you know, when I do a set list for stage, it's like, well, what do I want to sing tonight? And then I invite people into that space. It's not about, like, what do people want to hear? Um, because it's – I know if I'm filling myself up, I'm, I give out, like, this different experience than almost feeling like a, um, a robot in a lot of ways. And, you know, it's like I have spent so much of my life entertaining people. It's like, well – I need to entertain myself too. Like I need, <laughs> it needs to be fun for me at the same time. Cause it can, it can feel really empty. Otherwise it always feels like there's so much energy going out and like not enough input, um, filling you up. So I've really had to, to learn. There has to be a balance there for sure. I mean, obviously you're doing something that you love and it's a mm. natural talent, but it's something that you've honed and something that you love sharing with everybody but do you look back at your childhood specifically and think, oh, I wish it had been different. I wish I'd had a, a more sort of normal childhood. Um, I, maybe at times. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, it is it is what it is like that's This is my life. And so there's so many things about who I am that that the kind of childhood that I had, um, it influenced so much of, of who I am today. So. Um, and I like a lot of those pieces, so I wouldn't say that I necessarily wish it would have been different, although there were, there are times when I definitely wish I would have been around, you know, kids more, or been able to just play more. Um, my life was very much about business and working, and, um, I think I had to learn how to play as I got older, like allow myself to have that, um, that fun, because my life was very kind of serious and business oriented. And also, like you said, you want to please people around you, whether that's, I'm imagining at the time, the record label that you're working with or the audience that you're performing in front of. And I think starting work as a teenager myself, I've certainly, well, I'm still trying to unlearn a lot of the stuff that was really imprinted on me then, mm -hmm. that you've got to be a good girl. You've got to show up. You've got to yeah. know your lines. Yeah. You've got to do the right thing. You've got to stand on the mark. And then you've got to, yeah. you know, represent yourself outside of the TV studio, whatever it might be. That good girl thing is the a good bitch. girl thing. is so, so fucking awful. <laughs> I hate it. And I, but I'm still unlearning it now because I think we all I've got are. to do the right thing. I've got to be yeah. good. I've got to be good. And it stops you from messing up organically and it's it makes you beat yourself up when you mm. go wrong. I think that for me personally has been the biggest one to unpick starting work potentially too young. Well, it, start, it stops you from taking risk also yeah. because you're afraid to fail. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think as women in general, we are all unlearning the good girl. I mean, I've been through so much therapy in my life, but 
one of the things that keeps popping up the narratives um, that pops up often is I'm bad. Like, you know, Same. it's, yeah, I'm bad, I'm bad. And <laughs> my therapist is always looking at me going, what? <laughs> like, yeah. here we go again with this narrative of I'm bad, but it shows up in like all these different little areas of my life. And I think just as a woman in this world, um, you know, you go back to like the original sin, you know, of Adam and Eve, and it's like that narrative that started it all. And so um, I wrote this song called The Wild on my album God's Work, and it really is about undoing that narrative and, you know, stepping into the fullness of who we are as women and, you know, saying no when we mean no, like saying and allowing ourselves that fullness of, you know, I am, I am feral. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a woman who, you know, owns my sexuality and, and my good girl and everything else in between. And it doesn't have to be so, um, one dimensional, you yeah. know, and, and that's, you know, how we've been taught is, to come up in this world and like you said do the right thing and yeah. be the good girl and there's nothing there's nothing else outside of that except like slut and you know bitch yes. and whatever else it may be I know so everything else is derogatory we're sort of taught that you know you follow these simple steps and you are an acceptable female and you will be accepted on a societal level because you've got to show up looking a certain way acting a certain way suppressing anger all the other yeah. things that making we know our, I mean making ourselves making our bodies small like making ourselves smaller in every way yep yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, it's culturally, it's a lot to unpick even outside of our own respective stories. Mm -hmm. It's culturally a huge thing for all of us to try and untangle from. It really is. And it's not easy. It's really not easy. No, but I think the more we, we talk, we have conversations like this mm. um, and women know that they're not alone in, um, in that war. Because um, I think we fight the war internally against ourselves. Um, and I think the more we talk about it, that, you know, we we don't fight it or we we're able to unravel that a little yeah. bit for ourselves yeah and just like look at our humanness yeah like I have yeah. every time I do one of these podcasts and we've done loads and loads of these but I'll still sometimes internally be going in my head you know don't stumble don't fuck up remember where you're at or <laughs> where are you going with it because you want to be accepted and it's like no I'm a human yeah. there's going to be bits where I derail slightly or we go off on a weird tangent or it's not normal or acceptable or whatever but it's still okay and yeah. then we stop berating ourselves for every imperfect moment is mm -hmm. wild what we're doing to ourselves it's so true i mean like i was saying when i walked in i'm like please forgive me i'm jet lagged you might have to help me with words because and that's the thing i one thing i've learned is like show up in your humanness and like show like allow that to come forth as the first thing like your authenticity and your humanness i think if you just like lay it out there then I've learned, I mean, I think it was, it, for me, laying my life out there, who I am out there at one point became like a survival mechanism because I always felt like if people, if they don't have anything on me, then they can't come at me. Um, but then I realized, I'm like, oh, this is just like, this is just a good, being a good human, like in living in my humanness as a woman and just being like, hey, I'm, I'm on my period today or I'm really tired or whatever it may be. Like just this is this is where you're meeting me. Yeah. Um, and it life becomes a whole hell of a lot easier that way. Yeah, I think you then drop the expectation on yourself yeah. because every day your best is gonna be slightly different. Yeah, totally. You know, and that gives us all just a chance to have a sigh of relief. Like right. it's okay. <laughs> Not everybody has to be like totally. my worst phrase is living your best life. I'm just like, mm. fuck <laughs> off with living your best life. What is that? It's different every day. Yeah, yeah. It's different every something day. Something that's really I love you said phrases because bettering myself has become like something that I don't love to say. It's like if I want to grow if I'm in that and I feel like we we all kind of ebb and flow of like there's some stages in life where you just kind of you're idling and living and then there's other stages where you're like really growing and expanding and you have to know that you kind of go back and forth between the two and it's not constant growth all the time no. um but you know i think when we live in this kind of wellness health conscious world it can get really toxic too because yep. people are always like how do i better myself how do i get better what am i you know it's and it, that's exhausting, too. I've been there. I've been there, like, reading every book and doing every, you know, breath work and this and that. And I love it. Like, it's, it's still a part of my life, but I'm not so obsessive about it because I'm accepting where I'm at now. Like, now is okay. Yeah, I mean, I heard <laughs> you talk so, about this and, and using wellness to shame yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, lots of us are doing that subconsciously. And mm -hmm. 
It's interesting because this podcast <clears throat> and everything else that we're doing with Happy Place, we have a, we have a festival, we have a book imprint, we have an app, we have like lots of different resources and tools, a YouTube show. I'm so conscious that we have to keep this on the right side of wellness and it can't yeah. become... I mean, it certainly won't become preachy for me because I don't fucking know anything. I'm just stumbling <laughs> through trying to work it out and we sharing are. stuff with people. Yeah. But it's got to be on the right side because when it becomes another thing to add to a list of shit that you haven't done mm -hmm. and that you start to then beat yourself around the head with, oh my God, I haven't meditated today or whatever it might mm -hmm. be, then it becomes the total... It's just stressor all of a sudden. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got to stay on the right side of it. And I think it's important to talk about that and that you know there will be days where you just think, I don't want to do any of this. I just want to you know, watch TV and that's yeah. like perfectly fine. We've got to, we've got to be able to talk about wellness and not mm. totally vilify. We've got to be able to talk about it sensibly and yeah. not get preachy about it totally. and prescriptive about it, I think as well. Yeah. I, um, I actually had a, and do have a podcast called, um, Holy Human. Oh, and it's gorgeous. Th thank you. And I, I love doing it, but it's all been driven by my passion. It's like, who do I want to talk to? Whose book am I actually reading? And, it's never been about like, I have to turn on a podcast all the time. And, you know, I've gone a year without doing it. I know it'll come back, but it's, it's like all my time. So it, that's kind of how I like to live my life now is, you know, I, I feel like even in business, you know, it's constant, you know, content and constant this, everything's constant. Yeah. And it's just becomes the joy gets taken out of it. Um, and yeah, I understand the business side of it, but there has to be like, there has to be a balance. There has to be joy. And for me, um, I, I really have to, I, I try not to let my life be driven by, like I said earlier, someone, you know, someone else's expectations. So um, I get it. And I, in fact, I've, I want to bring the podcast back, but I've been, I also have been toying with the idea of like, okay, where do I want to come at it from? Because like you're saying, you want to be on the right side yeah. of wellness. And it's like, I really want people when they're listening to it to understand that you don't have to do any of these things. These are just suggestions. And this is just like fun exploration and curiosity. And, you know, because there's so much of the other out there. And so, um, yeah, I'm constantly just wanting people to not feel like they're bad. Yes. <laughs> I, I guess I'm so aware of it myself of how that narrative runs me. And um, I'm really cognizant of wanting to not add to that narrative in yeah. any way, you know? No, none of us, none of us need that. That's yeah. for sure. We need to be able to just go easy on ourselves, be, be, yes. be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. And the, the joy aspect, you've mentioned the word a couple of times now, I think is extremely interesting. It's my it's, new favourite word. It's a great <laughs> word. It's a great word. And I think something all of us wonder about a lot, mm. what brings me joy? Where do I find it? What does it even mean to me? And I watched um, a really interesting YouTube video of you talking to a brain doctor about periods where you've had extreme lack of joy. Mm -hmm. I have absolutely had that as well. But it was really interesting to see him connect the dots. And I think he used the phrase, you'd worn down your your joy centre or something, or dopamine centre. Yeah, my center dopamine centres, yeah, and, that's um, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and it, it makes total sense. You know, if yeah. you're gigging from a very young age, and, you know, to you that became the norm, but mm. to any regular person standing on a stage in front of thousands of people and having them react to what you're doing and for you to energetically feel that would be out of this world right but when you're doing it so regularly and it's the norm and you're not necessarily getting that transaction or that feeling still or maybe you get it and it peaks and then it drops off really quickly <sighs> yeah that makes sense you're gonna wear down your dopamine center yeah my after a show um there is such a high of the show that there is a major come down um i can feel so tired the next morning and then when i'm constantly working and on tour and then i have like six weeks off this first couple of weeks are, are rough and I've had to learn how to find, you know, joy and enjoyment in the mundane, like yeah. just the everyday life. And, you know, I didn't that part of my life wasn't developed so early on. So, you know, just being home and hanging out on the couch with my family and cooking or just being around the house like that's I was constantly looking for like what's next. Um, so I've gotten a lot better at being able to balance that for myself and actually finding just joy in everyday life, <laughs> yeah, which is nice. Well, I guess uh, it's why we see so many musicians specifically mm -hmm. moving into drink and drugs because you've had the highest high you can have on stage yeah. 
So then you're going, well, what, what is next? Where do I find that yeah, next Yeah, that's high? the druggiest drug of, of all. <laughs> it really yeah. is. It's such a high. And, um, you know, to have that high and that stimulation from such a young age, um, yeah, I was like, well, what, what's life? Like, <laughs> what's life outside of this? Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely why you see so many musicians um, go down very difficult, you know, drug like drugs and alcohol that kind of path for sure at what age did you start to contemplate finding your joy elsewhere where did you notice god i'm just not feeling great at the moment or you've just felt depressed where, when did that kick in um my my mom was really depressed as when i was a kid and so i kind of grew up around depression and i think it really ran in my family so i think i was probably dealing with it from a very young age um but not till i don't know maybe my mid 30s that i really start to be like okay there <laughs> there has to be i have to be able to come home and my nervous system not be completely like um, you know, on stun and be able to just sit on the couch and enjoy that. And it's, I mean, that's really taken me the last couple of years is probably the first time, you know, that I've actually been able to do that. And that's, that's been, you know, a lot of therapy and a lot of just understanding my nervous system and um, a lot of different, like, homeopathic things and just I mean it's there's so many components that have gone into you know relaxing my nervous system um yeah sleep has been a big thing for me like you know just just to be able to come home and and unwind was it was such a challenge so these last couple of years I feel like I've kind of gotten that under control a little bit more so where I'm where I can come home and actually decompress um but yeah my the joy part of it you know, I'm still learning what brings me joy. Um, but I know that it's there. Like I'm, I'm, I've, I was mentioning to a friend recently, I said, you know, I'm, I, I don't get sad a lot very often, which is good. Like I usually would, I love, I love sad music anyway, but like I would, I'm so like, everything was sad. Everything, all the music I listened to was sad. Everything was just, I just kind of had this like little dark cloud hanging over my head and it wasn't, that I was just like super walking around depressed. It was just kind of like low grade, which is almost worse sometimes I feel. <laughs> it's like I'd rather be, I'd rather know I'm like super depressed and be like laid out than just like eh, a little mm. bit depressed and a little sad. Um, but recently I felt, I felt pretty consistent with just, you know, knowing that like there's all these different emotions floating around. I can be sad, but it doesn't like drag me under. Um, and that's where I feel like I've, I have more joy that's accessible to me. Um, and I feel like because I'm learning how to access that more often, it's, it kind of gives me this balance of, um, knowing I have something to touch upon that I can go to, um, and not get so like drawn back into that sad, um, sad state. So sadness can be there. It can pop up, but it's not like it hangs around all the time as it used to. Yeah. There's room for it all. Yeah. There's room for it all. And it's interesting because like you're mm -hmm. using the word access, which is, you know, a really lovely word to use because it is in all of us, mm -hmm. but I think we're taught by society. Oh, it's over there. It's yeah. in the future or it's out there somewhere and you can attain it rather than access it. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really lovely thing just to stumble along or stumble upon naturally, oh yeah, it's in me. I just mm -hmm. need to work out what sparks it and what brings it out of you. Yeah, and I, I've noticed too, if I'm just really present within my day, um, if I'm, one of the things that I do a lot is if if a butterfly, I was noticing the other day I was walking and a butterfly flew by and it brought a smile to my face and I actually paid attention to that. I was like, oh, a moment of joy. Like there's just, it's not like we have to walk around like, oh my God, life is amazing, like all the time. Um, it's just looking at, looking for those moments where, you know, I'm feeling really crappy and it's like, oh, I had a really good meal or just like, you know, my friend made me laugh or whatever it is, you know, really kind of taking in those moments. So at the end of the day, you're like, oh wait, life, life wasn't so bad. Like I might've felt crappy, but it was a pretty good day. So knowing that you've got the propensity to have that sort of melancholy mm -hmm. feeling around what what is a definite no? What do you know is not going to serve you in terms of just feeling balanced and being able to access that joy? Oh, um, hmm. uh, you know, I have to be really careful about what I watch. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, 
I can easily, when I watch films, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm one of those people that will watch a film and then like, you're in it. I feel like I'm totally in it. Same. And it will last with me for hours after. So I have to be really careful about what I watch. Same here. I was yeah. watching last night The Deepest Breath on Netflix. Have you seen it? Mm-mm. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's about these free divers and they're exceptional. You're like, I can't breathe. First of all, I wasn't breathing. <laughs> I literally was holding my breath. But then also sometimes uh, they get towards the surface and they black out and they come up and their eyes are dead. And I was like, oh no. I'm out. I can't, mm. I can't actually do this. I can watch funny. I can watch factual mm. that is sort of educational but not too dark. Mm-hmm. I can't watch violence. I can't watch anything with drugs in or anything edgy. I just can't. I haven't got the capacity for it anymore. I could when I was younger. Yeah. But now it's a no. Yeah, I it's watch. No. Um, my husband was on this show called CSI Miami, and I went back and started watching some of the stuff that he did. And um, I have been married to him forever now, and I, we both just kind of like don't watch what other, each other does. But um, I started to one day, and it's like this crime show, and I will literally fast forward through like the <laughs> dead people. I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> no. So I love like the whole crime thing, and I love the mystery of it, but I'm like, no dead people, no, no dead people. I can't do it. <laughs> But I think you get to know what your capacity is as you get mm-hmm. older. And maybe when I was younger watching it, it was affecting me negatively, but I had no yeah, clue. Yeah, but you clues. just know. And on that note, one thing that I was very interested in reading about you was, again, something that I've experienced completely similarly, which is when you were younger, you would walk onto stage completely fearless. You would mm. sing your heart out. There would be a healthy dose of nerves, but nothing that would hinder you. And actually, later down the line that started to become a problem. And stage fright was something, a new thing that you were having to deal with down the line. Yeah, it definitely, um, it's definitely come into play. And I think that was a time in my life where I felt like a lot of people were picking me apart in a lot of ways. And um, I felt like a lot of things were stacked against me. And so it was like, don't fuck it up. (laughs) Because then they'll have something else to like, you know, add to the list of things that to stack against you. And so... I honestly think that that's what caused it. And then once I started to unravel that, it became a lot easier. So I I will get, um, I'll get like body nerves, but I won't get like this, these thoughts of like, oh my God, I'm going to mess this up. Or, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of, it's more of an anticipation now um, than a nervousness. Would it tip into <clears throat> panic ever? No. It never tipped into panic for me Um, because once I walked on to whatever I was doing or opened my mouth, I was like, "Okay, this is it. I'm in. I'm all in. So it just kind of, you know, it would flow from that moment. But it's it was that it was the self-talk and like the fear of messing something up and not being, quote unquote, good enough um, up until that moment. And then once it started, it was like, "Okay." It's fine. And then yeah. talk about exhaustion after, because like all those emotions, I'm like, I'm so tired. And you're trying to quieten that voice in your head the yeah. whole time. Just like, shut up. It's ex- it is exhausting. Yeah. It is, and you have to kind of honor that and go, right, how am I going to treat myself well the next day, mm-hmm. emotionally and physically? It's, you know, it's a whole process. Yeah. Around 30, you took yourself off to a rehabilitation center. Mm-hmm. What did you learn from that experience? How did that help you heal and get to the place that you are today where you're about to do this huge show at the OT, where you're releasing new music and you're seemingly in a in a really good place? Yeah, and by the way, it's funny, you just mentioned the O2 and I think of all the narratives. Like, I remember before we announced it, I'm like, is anybody going to come? <laughs> like, <laughs> People I'm are going to come. Like, I literally think to myself, yeah. like, oh my God, this is like too big for me. Is anybody going to come? Like, I have all of those thoughts just like anybody would have about anything that they do that's like you know a big deal so I'm not exempt from that but I'm like okay this is just my this is just my narrative right now and I know that that's not true so you just kind of have to put yourself in check a bit but um yeah no am I I think checking myself in I had never been alone ever um in my life there was constantly somebody around me and so that was the first time I really spent time alone and I needed that and it was it was just the beginning of um, my own, you know, kind of wellness self exploration journey. Um, that was definitely not the end all at all, um, but that was the beginning of it. So um, I'm grateful for that time, but that wasn't. It was. 
it wasn't what I think really started to kind of move me in the right direction. It was it was a stepping stone, but I feel like I actually when I found breathwork about two years later, that's what really like started to open me up and kind of break down some of those barriers and started to help heal the trauma. Um, I needed something that was more somatic and, you know, just talking about things and rehashing things is it's great and there's there's a place for it, but I think I needed something to really kind of internally like explore things for myself. Um, and breath work was that for me. Yeah, it's it's transformative. Yeah, I've done a really ton is. of it and it is <clears throat> I mean, it's bizarre what's happening to you physically when you go through, you know, especially you've got to obviously do it with the right practitioner and mm -hmm. someone who can really facilitate that, you know, very, very deep physical as well as emotional yeah. healing. What needed to be healed? Was the trauma specifically to do with being famous at a young age and living that life? Uh, I mean, that was a huge part of it. But I think, um, you know, no. I mean, I, I had a really, I mean compared to most, I had a great childhood, but I did have a, um, I had a, a rough childhood, I think, with my parents, um, my mom being very depressed, my dad being very angry, them not getting along. Um, I was an only child. I was kind of, I was the good girl that was pleasing everybody. And, um, and then growing up at the public eye and then going through a very public affair. And then, I mean, there was just a lot, it was a lot. And I, it was always so much forward movement that I never had time to stop and process any of it. Um, so I think there was just like 30 years of, of life there for me to try to start sifting through and emotionally and physically processing it because my, my little body and mind and soul is like holding on to, to everything. Yeah. We forget about the body bit in it. We're just yeah. like, Oh, what's <clears throat> all the stories I'm telling myself and the things that I've experienced. But like you say, you know, and that breathing can really get in on a cellular level to what you've been through and yeah. get it out, get rid of it. And seemingly all of this therapy and all of the practices that you've tried and everything that you're willingly throwing yourself into has gotten you into a really great place. You know, we oh, can yeah. even see it in, you know, I've heard you talk about your relationship with your parents now, which over mm -hmm. the years has been rocky. Your dad was your manager. Yeah, my dad just texted me while I was over here randomly. I'm like, oh, hi, I'm in London. Yeah, but you guys have, you know, have a great relationship now, which I think is so encouraging for people that perhaps either don't have a good relationship with their parents now or haven't in childhood. Well, I have a challenging relationship with my parents. So that's but it's, it's still, a relationship, but, but it's, it's still present. there. Yes, it's, it's, it's present. Um, and yeah, my my stepdad actually just passed away and my mom is now alone. And so we're learning how to navigate, you know, the new our new dynamic. And um, yeah, I mean, it's possible. And it's it's also possible to still like I still have my own, you know, I have my boundaries with my parents. I know what I can how how and how much I can take and how I can deal with them for my own, you know, mental and physical well-being. Um, and I can I give what I can and. Um, yeah, we all, you know, look, they were learning too, um, as parents, like we all, our parents all screw us up at some point and that's, that's why I don't have children of my own. <laughs> You've got stepkids. I do. And this I is... have two stepkids that hopefully I haven't and screwed up too much. stuff up. But like I'm a stepmom and I've, I've got kids as well. Yeah. And it, all of it, all, you know, I was a step, I was a stepmom before I had my kids. Okay. Oh, wow. Very and cool. I think that you just go, wow, okay, I see how hard this is. And I, mm -hmm. you know, thought a lot about, especially how much my mum did. And rather than focus on the things that might have been challenging, I've actually got deep appreciation for yeah. so much of it. And I think it does change your perspective. It does. How old are your kids? So we've got Honey, who's eight, Rex, who's 10, Lola's 18, Arthur's 21. So oh, we've wow. got a whole yeah, spectrum. Yeah, you really do. But yeah, my stepsons are now um, 20 and 16, and they were first two and six when they were in my life. Wow. And, um, yeah, it's, it has been amazing to, to help raise them. But, you know, it's, I think I had this, like, I had this thought of like I, I have there's so much trauma in my lineage and so much trauma in my life. It's like I wasn't ready to kind of pass down my, with my own children, like um, you know, through the womb. And I know how much gets passed down through the womb. So it's like okay, I wasn't I wasn't ready yet. Now at this point in my life, I think I'm would be totally ready for that. I just don't know if I want to. <laughs> yeah, well, that's we up have to two. You. We have two that are you know almost like completely grown, yeah. and it's like Eddie and I look at each other and we see kids and we're like, oh my god, they're so cute. We'd love to, and then. Like, do we really want to start over again? And yeah. 
you know, um, I think I'm, for me, like, you know, we talked about not having a childhood. It's like, I'm kind of, I've been mothering myself for a really long time and, and with my stepsons. And I, I feel like I've had, I feel like there's been a lot of mothering going on, even though I haven't ever had one of my own. So. Well, you're so right. I think, you know, this is something that you again stumble upon when you're doing any sort of work on yourself inventory is you've got to start parenting yourself mm -hmm. you have to because especially when you're a grown-ass adult and your parents aren't parenting you've got to parent yourself yeah. through challenging times mm -hmm. and it's something that isn't really talked about or we're not really taught that as a certain age at a certain age you're going to have to start parenting yourself mm -hmm. and knowing how to get yourself through situations it's um it's a tricky one, that. It is a tricky one. And that's where, you know, you talk about being softer and kinder to yourself. Yeah. It's like, you know, where your parents fell short, um, you know, we, we have those from a very early age, you know, everybody who was around us um, from parents to society, that those become our, our deep embedded narratives. And so it's like, okay, well, where they fell short, how can I now correct that for myself and be kinder and gentler and um and more loving and so yeah it's that's a daily practice yep. <laughs> it really is it sure is mm -hmm. and with step parenting mm -hmm. how have you approached that knowing you know like you say we've all our parents have all imprinted something on us whether negative mm -hmm. positive bit of both and also the sort of blended family dynamic it's a tricky one it's you know so tricky. it's a really tricky <laughs> one and you've got to navigate it Setting boundaries, and I think looking back to the start of my own step parenting journey, I definitely didn't set enough. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel confident enough to say what I was comfortable with or how I wanted to do things. I think that took a lot of time mm -hmm. and uh, incremental sort of building of confidence. How did you begin that experience of step parenting, and, and how do you think it's changed over oh, the years? Oh, it's totally changed since yeah. I was so young. I was yeah. in my late 20s, and um. Yeah, I don't know if you felt this, but at the beginning for me, like the first three years, it, I felt kind of like an outcast, you know, in, in my own family. And so it was, you you don't set a lot of boundaries, healthy boundaries, because you just want, once again, going back to, you just want everyone to like you yep. and you just want everybody, everything to be calm. And then you realize like, I mean, that's just a crazy dream. That's not ever going to happen. Like, here's all of these different personalities and you just kind of have to respect people's ups and downs and no, you know, for me, it was like, okay, how can I show up and be loving and accepting even when people are throwing tantrums and, you know, uh, there's issues and kids are throwing tantrums, parents are throwing tantrums. Like it becomes, you just, for me, it was like, okay, how do I just come up, show up and be as accepting and also, like you said, set boundaries and be like, you know, there is a certain level of respect that has to happen for us to be able to, to be blended. Um, and still to this day, like there's that that's hard. It's hard. So hard. It's, you know, because um, those boundaries can be crossed and you have to kind of I think you have to reassess. It's just kind of like situational. And, you know, um, as the kids get older, like they they kind of go in between and in and out of, you know, households and things. And they yeah, they make they make up their own mind about the world that they want to live in. And um yeah, and they're they're great kids. Like we've all done a really good job raising these boys, and um, and yeah, you're right. Like it it's it's interesting. They were really triggering for me. Um, they they showed me all the places in which I needed some healing, and it was yeah. it would have been so easy. I think kids are great. They do that with good for teachers. Parents. Yeah. Um, but the first like three or four years, I remember having this one moment where I remember very clearly like seeing how they like uh, the dynamic that we all had together was um was similar to like my childhood and I could see very clearly who was triggering what and what I needed to heal and there was a moment where I was like I can't blame these people for my issues and some people don't get there you know <laughs> some people don't but for me it was like if I'm gonna have if I'm gonna be in this situation in this relationship um, I have to handle my own stuff so that I can deal with what is surrounding me. Um, and, you know, to see the kids like have such an incredible father and 
um, and a childhood, like that was super triggering for me because I didn't. Yeah. Um, that's where it showed up for me for the first time where I really understood, oh, wow, I kind of do wish my childhood was different and I got to play and I got to just make mistakes and it wasn't, you know, millions of dollars wasn't riding on that mistake. And um, so I was, there was some, there was some bitterness there for a while of, and not towards the kids, but just like I in, you. in me. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I had to, I had to deal with all of that, um, which is great. I mean, it was, it was such an eye opener and I have dealt with all of that. And I love like, I've loved seeing the kids have a childhood. Like it's been, <laughs> I'll cry because it's, um, I didn't have that. And so to be able to give that to someone else, yeah, it's been really special. Mm. Oh, it's really beautiful. <laughs> well, see the things that make me cry, you don't even know. Like you're saying, <laughs> you're discovering these things about yourself. And, just sitting here. Uh, and it's really lovely because I think for people embarking on a blended family, there isn't enough resource out there for us yeah. to go, how do I do it? And there aren't enough positive stories going, this can be a really beautiful thing. That doesn't mitigate the challenges. No, it's, it's really, really hard. challenging. And it's really hard all the time. <laughs> yeah. But look, you know, you these tears are brought on by joy <laughs> yeah, and feeling yeah. part of something and yeah. knowing your contribution to their lives. And it doesn't have to be said aloud. It won't always be recognized. No. You won't necessarily <laughs> be thanked for it. Yeah. But I think having that, you know, yeah. is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, yeah. you know, every step parent has the opportunity to do that in their own yeah. way. And it will be bespoke and it will look completely different. That's but, the thing. Like everybody's yeah. situation is different. And no one, I, you know, don't pass judgment on anyone else's situation because you just nope. don't know what's going on. You don't. Yeah. You don't. And, you know, that's, again, something that you've had to get used to over the years and you've had to learn that lesson mm. because people in the public eye, there are assumptions about all sorts of things in their oh, lives yeah. and nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors apart from the people behind the door. Yeah, absolutely. So very true. Yeah, it is. But it's a, it's a beautiful thing and I think it's really important for step parents to hear it that it is totally doable. It can it is really hard. It always will be hard. Yeah. Parenting just in general is hard, but it is a really special beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. How do you suppose being a step parent or experiencing it could even be the the tougher sides, the challenges of being a parent and triggering things how has that opened up your songwriting and how you like to express yourself or the subject matters that you're wanting to do oh, yeah I remember well I wrote this song called love line which was on my album remnants and I wrote it for the boys and um <clears throat> it was there was so much I wanted to say to them you know um when I was first in their lives and I was definitely not an appropriate conversation and so I wrote a song called love line which is just about you know love being so much deeper than than blood like and I, you know, God, my family, what who I who I call family in my life, most of them are not blood. And, you know, it's it's just this it really has I think that's life has shown me that family is what you make of it. And so that, you know, it's definitely opened me up, um, my capacity to love, um, and to be able to express that through music. Yeah, they've they've changed that for sure. And do you think it's changed how you see your parents? Because again, you wrote a song, Mother, which is an extremely oh, powerful yeah. <laughs> song. And there's some. <laughs> that song kills me. Yeah, there's some raw uh, lyrics in there. And it's obviously something that you needed to say out loud. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my mom and I've had a, a very challenging time. Um, but I, as do a lot of mothers and daughters. And. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's given it's given me more empathy for for them and their wounded children, you know, that inside of them um, and that are very much present still in them. And so I think I can see um, some of their some of their pitfalls and some of still some of their actions. I, I, I see the kid. I see the wounded kid. Um and not necessarily like my, you know, the adult mom and dad. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's given me a lot more empathy for that, for sure. Mm. <clears throat> How is it singing that song out oh, loud? I, I can't. I, <laughs> um, I, it came on the other day and I we just started bawling. <laughs> my friend Hannah was like, no, it was before I went on stage. She's like, no, 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 turn the song. Turn the song, turn the song. <laughs> yeah. Put, yeah. Put Bruno Mars on, anything. Uh, exactly, quick. anything. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, it's, uh, 
some of those songs are, are challenging. Even I did Love Line, my, my, like I said, my stepdad just passed away, and I went through my set list after, right after he passed away, and I was like, okay, I prepared myself for all the sad songs, and I get to Love Line, and I'm like, oh, crap, I did not prepare myself for the song, and I literally, like, the whole last half of the song, I couldn't even sing. I was done. So, you know, music is... Music does that kind of thing, and especially, I don't know, I, I find with my music there's, I could be in one place when I write it, and then something in my life happens, and I find that there's another layer to what I wrote, and it hits me in a different place, and such as, you know, that moment about my stepdad, it was like, oh, wow, this is like a whole new level to this song, so that happens often, yeah, for sure, and then does. I listened to a song like Mother, and um. You know, after now her being alone, the first lines are, um, I am, you know, I want the best for you that you've always wanted for me. And I was, and then when I heard those two lines, I was like, oh, my God, because, you know, now I'm like helping her trying to navigate like this new life of hers. And mm. it's like you just want, you know, you want it's like she wants she's always wanted the best for me. And it's like now in her, you know, she's this her very fragile state at this moment. It's like you just want what's best for her and it, it, the roles kind of reverse in a little bit of a little bit of a way yeah yeah it's a beautiful song Thanks. I mean and I wonder yeah. if you know with your songs obviously there's the songwriting element and the lyrics which really touch people but I always wonder if this about singers who have that power to get people to you know just sort of shake off the shit from the day and have a good cry mm -hmm. Is there something in like the tone of your voice? There's something about the voice. It can't just be the lyrics. I don't think yeah. it can just be the lyrics. I think oh, there's no. something that's almost inexplicable that is tonal, that reaches people, that it that feels more sort of somatic or visceral. Mm -hmm. There's something about, or even you know, speaking voices. I think you feel it with people on the radio, perhaps that mm -hmm. their voice is comforting. I think with singing, it's got to be tonal as well. Oh, absolutely, it's vibrational yeah. for sure, and it's also the connection of. I'm trying to think of I'm actually trying to think of this as you're as you're asking me this. It's the connection of of emotion and story, like truly understanding like what you're singing about mm. um, and then expressing that through this art form. You know, it's yeah, it's there's a lot of components to it. I really haven't ever thought about what it is, but um, I think there's a frequency of the heart and the openness of the the person that then just kind of comes through the voice I think people if you're that open which I think I am when I sing it's just people experience that frequency mm. <clears throat> I'm, Beautiful. Like, I'm like that's really it's one of those things it's like it's almost like trying to explain the universe yeah it's like putting that into words that's really what it is it's like really I feel like I become this conduit for whatever that is to like yeah. flow through. That's why music hits. That's <clears throat> why we go to gigs and sway and go, this is great. You yeah. know, it's like, that's the whole beauty of it. Um, speaking of gigs, I just want to wish you all the love and all the luck for May next year. I'm so excited. Crowd. It's going to be so good. Yes, I'm so excited. It's going to be a blast. It's so. going to be great. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making me cry. I needed a good cry today. I'm about to start really my period, so it's all good. <laughs> Same. Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you. Yay. Oh, that thank was awesome. you. Yeah. That was so lovely.